Hello, hello. My name is David. Very nice to see you. This is a very weirdly shaped room for this kind of thing. But it's great. Uh, and I do like that we have some green on our right. So I worked at the Health Economics Unit. Uh, um, we are part of uh, Midlands and Lancashire CSU. Um, quite diverse team. There's a bunch of uh, data scientists, data engineers, health economists. Um, it's uh, exciting to have uh, people with so many different uh, skills and such a varied background. Uh, I, I usually shave. I don't like not being shaved. Uh, last week I had, a couple of, I had to have a couple of injections and I had a bad reaction, so I've not been able to shave. So you can see that I have a white beard growing. Um, when I studied, um, I studied computer science, I still label myself a computer scientist, uh, but I think I come from a generation where uh, the labels between computer scientist, data scientist, uh, software engineer were a little bit uh, blurred. Uh, we work with the NHS, work with uh, charities, um, we also work with the private sector, somewhat controversial, uh, but that uh, gives us the opportunity to um, look at a, a range of very diverse projects. Oh, sorry, I forgot something very important. We also work with universities. Um, so lots of very, very different people that we have connections with and lots of different projects, lots of different uh, tools we need to use. Um, yeah, worked with startups, worked with NHS. This picture is monstrous and someone did some photoshopping which made it even more horrific, so I'm so sorry. Um, so very, very lucky. Very lucky to work on a variety of projects with uh, lots of data and uh, lots of interesting questions to answer. Um, some of them more traditional, uh, like uh, you know, looking at risk stratification, looking at uh, um, problems that we've already solved in many different ways, but we're still looking for perfection. But also we're looking at uh, more um, unconventional, uh, newer problems, and uh, um, something that we're quite passionate about is impactability modeling. So the idea that uh, um, we really want to understand uh, in our patient population, in, in, our, in our population, which interventions are actually going to work um, instead of just throwing lots of money at the top of our risk pyramid, actually really, really figuring out how we match patients and interventions. Uh, today I'll, I'll, I'll mention something else that uh, um, we're quite interested in, and that's uh, creation of uh, synthetic data. Um, we were hoping to start work on a very ambitious project soon, but we don't have the funding, so if you have any spare money in your pockets, uh, please come talk to me. Um, I, I absolutely don't want to be controversial. I'll try. I also try not to swear. I tend to swear always at conferences. I'm just, um, so I have a slightly complicated relationship with uh, um, the some of uh, this marketing, this packaging of uh, some of the conferences, because on one hand, I'm a strong believer in the power of communities, and I think something like this is extremely, extremely important. Uh, I love that uh, uh, I've been speaking to lots of different people, and uh, there is such a variety of levels of experience and interests and sub-interests and uh, uh, but we've all worked with R at a certain point and some people in this room uh, have uh, just started learning and are writing their first lines of code other people are super masters um, but as Dan uh, I think Dan said earlier uh, let's not forget that there are other languages and they're great I agree, but I'm going to take it one step further. Um, there are other languages, and they are essential. As we move towards bigger, more complex projects, uh, really understanding what is in our toolbox. And 
in the first place actually buying the right toolbox and having the right things uh, to use um, is, uh, is going to be absolutely crucial. Um, so for me personally, it's not so much about our Python, it's about uh, building great projects, b building uh, the, 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 right, um, the right flow for whatever project we are working on. And uh, I left my phone in my bag, so I don't know how much time I've been speaking so far. Uh, I might need some help with that in a moment. Um, a few, maybe 15 years ago or so, maybe less, uh, somewhere between 10 and 15 years ago, I was at a programming conference, not too dissimilar to this one. And uh, I went to talk about Facebook. And uh, they were telling the most bizarre stories, at least for me, for, for someone who had uh, more limited experience at that point. It, it sounded so weird. So that they, they were growing quickly. Um, yeah, we know that Facebook has, Facebook has grown a lot. And uh, one day they had, uh, they, they were struggling. They were really struggling to keep up. So their code base was pretty much all PHP. And as many scripting languages, PHP does what it does really well. It's not always the most efficient, right? Just getting problematic. They kept on buying servers and servers and servers and server farms. They, 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 it was a struggle to keep on scaling up. So they had the big hackathon. And someone came up with the weirdest idea. So we get the request from the client side, from the browser. We take the request, we take our PHP code, we pull G++, sorry, we translate the PHP code into C++, we pull G++ out of our sleeve, we compile on the spot, we execute the uh, software on the spot, and then we send back semantically uh, equivalent responses. And that cut down the processing requirement by about 50%. I find that outstanding. Uh, first of all, how did anyone come up with uh, something so bizarre? Um, but it's a great example of how sometimes um, We'll have in our wonderful teams, uh, we'll start fostering one element, one part of our skill set. And uh, we'll get to a point where it's a necessity to break out of that. And the solutions are not always the, the, the most straightforward, the, 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 the most intuitive. Um, but I think uh, this is now discontinued. I think Facebook has a completely different technology under it, under it at the moment. Um, but I, I found it very interesting and uh, that spirit of really trying to understand what's actually going to work has very much stayed with me. Now let, let's talk about this problem. I, I th this is another problem that I think is quite fun. Um, why on earth would I want synthetic data in the first place? Um, there's a few reasons. Uh, one, we are a growing community, right? Uh, where we have more and more people and we want to keep on expanding. We want to bring on board more people. Um, ideally, we want uh, to train the new data scientists, the, 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 the people uh, of our future with healthcare data because we, we fully appreciate that healthcare data are unique in some ways. Um, human beings are uh, complex. There's a lot that goes into a human and uh, uh, healthcare data reflects that. Uh, so ideally, we really like really good synthetic data to support training. I think it's something that uh, uh, I strongly believe in. But also I, uh, so juggling many projects, I see a lot of uh, and I, a lot of IG processes, I have a lot of conversations, I go to a lot of panels, 
defending projects, trying to get access. Um, sometimes just because we want to test an idea, because we want to create a prototype. So if we had a really, really good, comprehensive data set that could help us test things, so uh, that, that could help us speed up research and development, um, I do think that uh, it could really, really help. Once again, if you have any money laying, laying around, just let me know. Um, something that is quite tricky about uh, synthetic data is how will you think about uh, the evaluation? Um, so synthetic data is going to be based on something that uh, already exists and absolutely you want to make sure that uh, um, it cannot be reverse engineered, that it cannot be, uh, that it's not going to breach anyone's uh, privacy. Um, but also you want it to be uh, Lawyer, you want it to be realistic. Uh, you want to have a good, high fidelity. So it, it is a, a, a technically interesting uh, problem. But some people, and maybe some of them are in the room now. Uh, oh, ooh, something has disappeared there. Oh, sorry. Um, what we would like to do, really, is to take this data set. So I have a good relationship with the, the kid people, the Kent integrated data set people. Um, so a lot of the IG panels that I go to are often with them. And if you ever do end up with them, they're actually pretty good at their job, in my opinion. Um, I, they will ask a lot of questions uh, about your project, but they're usually sensible questions. So it's a population of about uh, 1.8 million and it covers quite a lot across many different tables, right? So what we're trying to create is a large description of a population across a multi-table data set. Once again, appreciating that uh, Healthcare data, the data that we tend to work with day in and day out are complex and we want to make sure that when we train people and that when we test our ideas, we do that with something that is realistic, that feels like the, like the real thing. Here we go. So some people might be in the room here. Um, so some colleagues have done already some work on this, and it's really, really good. Um, so the Skunkworks Lab, does it still exist in that label? Maybe it has changed title, maybe not. Um, has created a tool that does that. Um, it's uh, based on uh, a variational autoencoder. Um, I don't know if it's something that you encountered before. Um, you have a layer that learns, uh, it's an artificial neural network layer that uh, learns about the properties of uh, um, data set. Um, and then it's usually called the decoder layer that takes samples and generates something new from it. Um, I think I've seen it somewhere, I've seen it described somewhere as a uh, uh, gener generative layer. I think I personally prefer that technology, uh, that terminology. Um, bottom line is, it is, this is a technology that has been tried and tested on uh, a number of similar problems. Uh, so variational autoencoders uh, are used to uh, generate a number of uh, synthetic things um, online. So this is good. This is a great starting point. Um, however, when we start looking at a uh, um, large multi-table data set, um, things start getting uh, a, a bit tricky. 
Um, there are relationships across tables um, that uh, we need to preserve. Um, so we started looking at uh, how we could potentially be running uh, multiple models, uh, keeping some parameter, hyperparameters consistent, but also introducing some constraints. So for obvious reasons, um, you know, I want to make sure that we don't create a data set where we have an, uh, I don't know, a 95-year-old man with, uh, that is currently starting to suffer from postnatal depression because that's uh, not very realistic. Um, so this is something that we would like to do, as I said. Uh, at the moment, we are in very much in uh, um, wishing stage, um, trying to pivot back into what goes into work like this. Now, I fully appreciate that uh, a lot of this uh, um, interaction between technologies is probably already very, very, very common um, in many of your roles. But building it deliberately, I think, is something that we we'll really, really need to make sure we do um, instead of keeping on developing with what we know. Um, SQL is ever, and I appreciate that probably it's at the beginning and sometimes in the middle and maybe even at the end of many of your projects. Um, it's very, very likely um, that our chain will then go through R. I think we found R great for uh, a lot of our exploration of, of data. Uh, it's something that uh, uh, we've been using consistently and that we are very comfortable with. Um, here, somewhat provoci provocatively, I've decided to include Prolog for identification of uh, constraints. Um, my background is very much in symbolic AI. Um, now, there, there's a lot of this that could be done as well in some uh, Lisp dialects. Uh, or many other uh, languages. Um, the point I'm trying, trying to drive here is really making sure that we can build that integration. Now, the Python bit. So I do think that uh, the, uh, the, co the core engine of, uh, of the project is very much going to be um, in Python. Uh, that is where the, the biggest strength uh, is going to be uh, for that type of uh, um, that type of technology. But then, once again, uh, going back to R uh, for an interface. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of great uh, stuff that can be done in Python in that sense. Um, but we do have uh, probably slightly better tools in R and we definitely have more expertise in R. Um, which brings me to my next, uh, um, next point, which is, uh, um, I think Sarah mentioned this morning, tech time and training, which I really liked. And uh, I think I might uh, uh, start uh, stealing. Um, Getting all of this in place is absolutely fine. Uh, it's absolutely feasible. Um, but it does take a bit of time. Now, I'm absolutely not advocating that uh, every person in every team should learn um, every possible language. Um, but making sure that we give people time and space to broaden their horizons, um, I, I, I think, has huge, huge benefits. Um, Making sure that uh, everybody can expand their toolbox uh, is crucial, especially uh, when projects projects start uh, increasing in complexity and the technologies that you're using um, become more numerous. Um, QA, for example, gets trickier very, very quickly. Uh, and I'm sure we've all 
stumbled upon uh, a poorly designed QA process before. Um, but also there is the tech. Um, and none of this is rocket science. And all of this is pretty straightforward once um, we wrap our um, has around it, and once we give people the right tools, and once we let people explore uh, the, 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 the the tools that are available to them, but uh, we, we should not uh, underestimate how easy it is to uh, just uh, um, fall when we don't need to fall because there are plenty of options available. So focusing on R and Python, there are so many options so many ways when your project grows and you need to pass data and uh, um, between the two. Um, for very simple stuff, we don't even need to do anything sophisticated. Um, Jupyter Notebooks have been in my life for less than other technologies because I'm very old. Um, and I think most Jupyter kernels um, tend to uh, run Python or R, uh, but there are script of scripts uh, kernels that you can implement um, that will allow you to mix and match as you need. Uh, but also, um, you can use Reticulate to call uh, Python from R. You can use RPY2 to call R from Python. And let's not forget about the beauty of uh, scripting, uh, whether it's a terminal, PowerShell, or if you're using batch files. Um, I know that those are the nuts and bolts, the simple things um, of uh, the old guard, but they're still extremely, extremely effective. Um, when we, need, when we need to start uh, bridging gaps between technologies and we want to make sure that uh, um, everything is flowing smoothly. Uh, I think it's great to be here and it's great to have a main uh, room uh, full of people talking about R and it's great to have some space where the Python community and the R community can come together. Um, but let's not forget about uh, the wider ecosystem and let's uh, make sure that uh, as we, be, we develop our capabilities, we have our eyes open and uh, we're, we're not restricting ourselves. And I, I know that for many of you, that's going to be very obvious and natural. But in the NHS, we are quickly training the next generation of data scientists. And the last thing we want to do is to create two narrow a foundation and uh, yeah let's think about let's all think about what Sarah said about uh, tech uh, uh, time and training um, as that's going to be uh, crucial to make sure that uh, we can uh, um, build robust uh, tools for the future thank you David